maybe we can start. So, um, well, it's a nice topic. Um, just a quick note, I will just give an overview. I will not dive into details because that's not possible with Jenkins in, in 50 minutes. Um, the first slide is, in fact, I didn't know if I wanted to... Oh, that's the reverse. Yeah. I didn't know if I, I had to do an, intro to, uh, an introduction about who am I. There was some discussion uh, last week about on Twitter about speakers. Oh, do we need to do that uh, introduction about who we are or not? Well, I still think it's a good idea, but after the presentation about GDPR, I don't know if I'm allow allowed myself to do a, a whiz, or you are allowed to do a whiz on myself, so I don't know. Uh, but I'm, so my name is Fabien Rotin, I'm um, working in the CentOS Infra team, I'm the, cent the main sys admin for CentOS. Um, I started working with Linux in uh, 1998. Um, my first experience was Slackware, which was awful, coming from the Microsoft world. Um, but then I think I learned a little bit more uh, in 20 years. I like to present myself as a DevOps practitioner. Uh, meaning that I like to keep, I like to break things in loop, but I have a feedback loop with myself, so I improve the way I break things. Uh, so that's how I ended to be a sys admin for the CentOS Infra. So uh, a little bit of backstory for the presentation. Um, it's it's just because I made a promise to someone three years ago, and he's in the room today, so I'm quite happy with that. Thanks, GP. Um, <laughs> For the last load days we had in 2015 um, at the social event and after that at the hotel, at the bar, we just discussed about some crazy idea I had back from my previous job where we were using Ansible to automate a lot of things, uh, but we had to let other people using the automation that we did at the operational side. And uh, Jenkins was really a perfect glue for that. I will explain why. And um, why it still makes sense in 2018 to still probably use Jenkins on top of Ansible. Because, of course, in the last three years, some other tools appeared, including Tower or AWX, which makes sense if you start with that from scratch. But in other cases, uh, it can still make sense to still use Jenkins instead of AWX. I will cover that um, and the reason why. But the first reaction when I discuss about using Jenkins or anything else on top of Ansible is why do we need something on top of Ansible? Because Ansible Core, the whole lo logic is in the playbook, in the role, in your inventories. So why do you need something on top? Because you prefer, C uh, you prefer CLI tool usually. That's true. That's true if you just look at the um, upside of it. But chances are that you are working in a company or in a bigger environment and you are not the only one concerned. So you have to let other people see or consume what you have automated. And um, <laughs> my personal experience was, well, the famous buzzword, which is not a buzzword anymore. DevOps is not a buzzword anymore. I should have used blockchain maybe in the slide. That's more, <laughs> you know, uh, but I, yeah, I forgot. So for me, uh, some people still think about DevOps like being developer versus operation, or operational people complaining about the development. But it's not real true. Uh, I think that that view is really too simplistic view of the real problem. Um, in my case, it was not about develop development versus operations or the reverse, but about something else who in the room has never had to fight with release management. Please raise your hand if you never had to fight with release management. One, you are a lucky guy. So, great. So, in my case, it was not developers versus operational, but we were both together fighting against release management. It's really a pain in the ass if, for example, you have automated a lot of things from the development, development team uh, compiling everything, testing, unit testing, integration test, that you have also automated deployment to production, but that suddenly someone higher in the food chain in the company said, no, we will just release four times a year at that specific time. Even if we are releasing, um, we are working in a 24-7 environment, we will only release and pushed to production on Saturday or Sunday, because, because what? It's 24-7 workflow. Stupidity. 
And we had to fight with that, and we had to have people <laughs> on call or just there, just because release management said, oh, now it's time for you to deploy. Please let your automation work. That's completely stupid. So um, we had to, to change the mindset, and it was really a problem. But in the company there, we had already Jenkins tied to the corporate um, LDAP setup. So we had already a possibility to know who triggered what, when, for which reason. So suddenly it was easy for us to let people from the release control management be in charge of pushing themselves the button when they want to, because they were just using the automation that we put in place for them. And we had the audit trails and audit log for free with Jenkins, because it was there. So suddenly we, had no to, we, we didn't have to do the, a lot of things like Fill, uh, filling the famous CCF for the change control form that was discussed only once a week during the change control board meeting where everybody from each team, which is a silo, uh, can say, oh, it doesn't impact production to just put a network cable in the switch, etc., etc. So we just, uh, it was possible uh, to get rid of that shit just with tying uh, Jenkins with Ansible playbook. So a little bit of 101. This was a, another discussion, do we need to do one-on-one uh, in the presentation or not? It depends. So I guess a lot of people in the room knows Jenkins already. Um, it started a long time ago as the Hudson project uh, within Sun in 2004. Uh, and it was renamed, thanks to Oracle, I should say, <laughs> uh, to Jenkins. Uh, but there's something interesting about Jenkins. Um, maybe uh, seven years ago, or eight years ago, whatever, uh, people were thinking of Jenkins as just focusing on development, so compiling code and just running unit tests. But that's not the case anymore. If you go to the main page of Jenkins, at the moment they even rename uh, the, um, the domain from Jenkins CI to Jenkins.io. Um, I had the opportunity to go to, to Fosdem and discuss with Koshuke at the Fosdem booth, and they said that clearly they have more and more people using Jenkins in the automation framework for even automation and deployment from what was supposed to be uh, a task for the operational guy. So that's the reason why they said that they are now an open source automation server. Not only having focus on building package, building uh, application, but just the whole, the whole thing including deployment. So Jenkins can do, of course, authentication, uh, hopefully. Um, the first case is internal users DB, which probably not a lot of people are using. Um, LDAP, and we had a stupid joke this morning at the speaker uh, uh, lunch, breakfast, um, for the L in LDAP, because the L, the L, which is supposed to mean lightweight in LDAP, has the same meaning as the S is an MP for simple. <laughs> so um, we still don't get it, but it's still there, and it's still corpora corporate and enterprise -y, uh, solution. Uh, you can also let Jenkins outsource the authentication to the servlet container, uh, whatever it is. But you can have also other plugins, um, like, well, of course, Active Directory, which is just an enhanced version of LD LDAP, and other one like OpenID. Uh, and that was something for the CentOS infra that I was really interested in. So if you know the CentOS uh, infrastructure, you know that we have um, an accounting system and user database, which is called accounts.centos.org which is, uh, in fact, the same version of the software that Fedora is using, which is FAS, Fedora Accounting System. Um, and by default, it doesn't emulate some enterprise things like LDAP. But thanks to other software that play a bridge, uh, like Epsilon software, uh, we are able to be our own identity provider using our FAS uh, backend for the user groups, password, whatever, GPG, public key, SSH public key, and uh, on front end, we have things like Samuel 2 Token, OpenID, OpenID Connect, um, those kind of protocols. I will not dive into details because Tim will give a lot of explanation about all the standard protocol tomorrow morning. Um, but that's something that um, I was interested in trying because there is an OpenID plugin for Jenkins. For the authorization, um, Jenkins has an interesting thing of setting up himself. Like, anyone can do anything. I hope that you don't use that. Or login user can do anything. No, so probably the, the, those two are the two that you will see the most uh, deployed. You can let people identify by 
group or specific user do specific thing in Jenkins like you can see the job, you can trigger a job, but you can't configure it, you can't, you can, you can't alter it. So you can, um, it's role-based access, so more or less the thing that AWX can do as well. Um, so just a small disclaimer, by the way, this talk is not a renting session against AWX. But just to provide you an alternative of what you can do, especially if you are already using Jenkins for something else in your company. So, of course, there are alternatives. And the most known is, well, Tower, because it was built from the people who uh, designed it, Ansible itself, Ansible Core Engine. So Tower is the, the, um, the one that you can buy a subscription for to get support, etc. Or there is also AWX, which was open source some month ago. And a lot of people were just happy with that. So myself, I said, oh, I would consider using AWX, suddenly, but I had a small issue, and the first issue is really a stupid one. Um, the CentOS infrastructure is really um, spread all around the globe. So it's not that we have a DC or two DC with a lot bunch of machines inside. We have sometimes one or two machines in uh, Malaysia, we have one machine in Australia, we have three in South Africa, we have th uh, four in Brazil, for example. So it's really, really all over the place. And the first issue we had was, because Ansible used SSH uh, as a transport to, to get to the remote node, uh, I let you imagine the latency if suddenly I, wa I wanted to just use one AWX, for example in the US, to talk to all my machines all, all over the world. That was really a, a problem. And it seemed that it's a scalability problem that uh, people at Ansible and AWS don't have yet solved. Uh, I discussed that internally and said, well, nobody asked for that yet. So there is no concept of node executor, for example. It is? Okay, I cor that's covered now. Great. Great. Yeah. So correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, of course. Yeah. When I, when I looked at that, um, the way it was set up before was uh, you need to set up tower and you can have a HA mode of tower but even if you had a remote machine tower they needed access to the Postgres HA mode which was the central one and when we tested that it was really not scaling at all so I wanted something stupid and simple and I just wanted something that was just consuming my Ansible uh, code <laughs> inventory transparently without interfering with that so that I could still use it manually if needed. So uh, I will cover the node, node, execu um, node executor thing uh, later on with uh, Jenkins slave because that's how you can do that really transparently and easy. Um, glad that it's now solved. So maybe Robin <laughs> uh, remembered the discussion I had with, uh, with her uh, at Fosdem. Um, AWX supports some authentication mechanism, but uh, so far that was not covering the one I was interested in, like OpenID. Uh, Samuel Token, I don't know if people have tested Samuel Token integration from AWX. It was not working last week, <laughs> confirmed by several people. So it was either internal or LDAP, uh, but it was not, for my specific CentOS case, it was not really working. Something else that we, we were just fighting uh, in the infra team about was the fact that you can, uh, in AWX, import inventory, but it becomes your source of the inventory. Meaning that if you want to still use a CLI, you have to uh, use a dynamic inventory that queries everything from AWX. I didn't want that. I want something just keep stupid and simple. So I want some, a, a tool on top just to continue to use it blindly and transparently. It doesn't even know what it is inside. It just, and Jenkins just consume what I have in Git. It doesn't even know. The inventory script, yeah, but I, didn't, I didn't want that. I wanted to, to be able to continue to use Ansib, uh, Ansible without any tools on top, just a standalone. So I just want to plumb another tool on top that consumes that, but I don't need to rely on that. I had the same problem with Foreman uh, because we were still a puppet shop before, and um, Foreman is the external node classifier for Puppet. But certainly, if you have a problem with Foreman, Puppet Master D is the kaboom because uh, it needs every, um, the, 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 um, the, the thing of working on top to get the, the source of inventory, the variable, etc. So we just wanted to, to get things stupid and simple. So that because you, you, <laughs> you would be surprised by people 
who know how to submit a small change in Git, but all who don't want to, to go into a tool to change that, or don't even want to use a REST API, whatever. So that's just keeping stupid and simple. Yeah, I'll just text inventory plane in Git, Git crypted repository. Great. Great. Um, some of my colleagues who tested last well said that you, it becomes the, the source of inventory. But great if you can do that. And that's the reason why I want to attend your talk because uh, probably a lot of my um, testing in the past are not valid anymore. So, um, some other one that you can use, um, I tested and I used for another project, Randec, uh, which is okay. Um, two small one like Semaphore and Pole March, uh, really targeted at lightweight deployment, so they don't have a lot of feature like um, scaling with a lot of uh, in the remote executor, uh, no authentication outside of the internal user DB. Uh, so that was not okay for me. So back to Jenkins. Um, Jenkins has pros and cons. So Jenkins is there for quite a long time. It's deployed in a lot of companies or environment. So it has a lot of feedback from a lot of users. So it has a, a strong, very strong community. Um, what I liked initially with Jenkins was that if you like to play with Lego when you were a kid, um, you can just assemble anything you want with Jenkins and suddenly in five minutes you can just have something working already. Um, and it's due to the fact that it's really modular and it has a lot and when I mean a lot, it's really a zillions of plugins available. So um, that's a pros, but at the same time, <laughs> it's a cons. For me, it's a problem. Um, for the environment, we have multiple Jenkins installed already uh, for, uh, for CentOS. The biggest one is the one that everybody can have a look at, uh, ci.centos.org. We have really a lot of jobs. But not only for the CentOS infra itself, or for the core distribution, but for all the projects that are building their package on top of us and do the CI automatically on us with CentOS 7, for example. Uh, think about OpenStack, about um, Gluster, about um, other projects like that. The problem was that they came with each time, oh, can, I just, can you just enable that extra plugin for me? Because in my workflow, I'm, I need that plugin. Sure. But imagine that multiplied multiply by the number of projects. The more you will add plugins to Jenkins, the higher the chance that it will become unstable. So I was expecting something like Jenkins, which was targeted for CI, to be fully tested. And it is. The core, if you stick to Jenkins core, it is really stable. I mean, I've never had really issue with Jenkins core. But the more you add plugins, that's really a problem. I, there are so many plugins that it's not possible to build a high matrix of all possible combinations of plugins between themselves. And that's where it hurts. So if you need plugins, read carefully, verify that they are maintained, test it, update it, and, um, and just stick to core if possible. Uh, the other probably weakness of Jenkins is, but it's just a stupid sysadmin private joke, is that it's Java based. So it needs just a little bit of tuning. Uh, yeah, some some build bar was considered for CI just for the CI part. Um, uh, some people from the OpenStack um, group um, has switched to Zool, which is their own internal testing, which is in fact using Ansible automatically. That's really tight. That's really the core logic of Zool is uh, just Ansible based. Um, but we decided just for the CI part, just to, to stick with Jenkins, because so many projects were using Jenkins that it was really easy for them just to, to yeah. That's also the part of the discussion. Um, if you have, or if you are already using a tool that you know, and that's how some people are really in diving, what are the chances that you need to, to, to learn something new and maintain something else in parallel while still maintaining uh, the first one? So, the other problem, potential problem was um, Jenkins deployment itself. 
because Jenkins can help you deploy software or even setting new virtual machine, uh, bare metal install, whatever. Um, but how do you deploy Jenkins itself? It's a kind of chicken, chicken and egg problem, for sysadmin at least. So, um, especially if you consider the way it's uh, actually configured. So, uh, if you have already played with Jenkins, there are zillions of XML files. Uh, and I'm personally not an XML person. <laughs> so, um, but there are some cool uh, tools that can help you with uh, maintaining, updating, and configuring uh, Jenkins. Ansible uh, has itself some uh, core module for that. So, um, like Jenkins job that lets you add automatically configure job uh, in Jenkins. Jenkins plugin, if you need some plugins, at the moment that's how I set up um, a simple Jenkins setup. Uh, it's coming from uh, my variable, Ansible variable inventory, and it's installed all the plugins. Uh, s Jenkins script to let you uh, launch automatically some Groovy script from Ansible. So that's quite nice. But the real solution, and it's at the moment it's work in progress, uh, and I now see that it's really badly written in blue because of the stupid uh, LibreOffice change to a URL, to link. But uh, there is an effort called configuration as code. So it started, um, in fact, at FOSDEM this year, there was a meetup, a Jenkins meetup. And uh, it was based on the request of a lot of sysadmin people willing to automate the Jenkins deployment itself. And they didn't want to because some of the things that I tested initially, but it's really not maintainable, is have all the XML file just be Jinja2 template. But I'll let you imagine the, the problem with all the plugins that you install. So at the moment, some people just said, well, why not um, configure Jenkins as a data, mm. uh, as code itself? And uh, there is a configuration as code plugin that will probably be released as 1.0 release in May that was announced. There was a meetup um, online uh, on YouTube this week about that. Um, so basically, you transform everything into YAML. And if you are already using Ansible, it just makes sense to continue to use YAML because you know it already. So it's really easy. Um, and uh, the idea is that uh, it will just fetch it from Git, from whatever. Uh, and it will automatically readapt the Jenkins configuration without a need for restart. Because that's the problem you have with uh, the, the traditional method. You just put new configuration, then you reload configuration, etc. But that will be covered automatically. So is that already production ready? No. Uh, we tested with my colleague the, fir the, the first version. But the new version that is supposed to come, which is the, fir the first one, should appear soon. So that's really a nice solution for um, system administration with Jenkins. So now, how can you uh, trigger uh, Ansible from, from, from Jenkins? Well, the most obvious answer is Jenkins knows everything about, about Git, or Subversion, or Mercurial, or AG if you want. But let's assume that everybody is using Git and store everything into Git. Um, Git is a um, t Jenkins is a nice way of watching Git repository and do things on, on commit. So everybody's doing that, like infrastructure as code uh, those days. So of course, Jenkins can do that natively, because it's, no, it's what it was uh, written for. The other way to, to do that is through um, API. So you can, uh, through API, or just through a, um, a, a curl request, for example, trigger some, some jobs in Jenkins. Uh, the first thing you have to know is that based on your authentication, you need an uh, authentication token, of course, and you need a specific gem Jenkins scrub as first request, and then you can uh, trigger the job itself. That means that you can then suddenly, um, uh, the use case we had was, oh, for example, uh, our Zabbix monitoring system detects something. I just want, when it detects that, launch an Ansible playbook somewhere, and it just does it automatically. That's really easy. Uh, the other thing I was interested in was coming from uh, the Puppet side. Um, if you have played with Puppet, is of course uh, you know that Puppet agent will check the, uh, the his catalog, the compile catalog uh, at regular interval, 30 minutes uh, at the Puppet mastery level, and I still wanted to use that uh, in the same way. So I don't know if people in the room have tested Ansible pool to do that, but for me it doesn't work correctly, especially if you need if you uh, if you need some specific vars or a vault, encrypted variables, etc. So it doesn't really work. So it was an easy solution for scaling, because suddenly you know you don't have to, to run SSH from the control machine, the management machine. Um, but here we can we can emulate that easily 
um, with the Scooter plugin that um, is embedded into Jenkins. So the one I prefer is the parameterized uh, scheduler plugin so that you can have just one job and you can give in the, it's, if you know the scheduler plugin it's like the, cron, the internal cron task of Jenkins you can run the same task multiple times with different parameters uh, so with one job you can for example just, oh, just run all those playbooks just with one job for example at different time um, one of the good things is um, what can you get back from, from Jenkins? Uh, it's not really readable there, but it's clear to know that it's really just an Ansible playbook call. Um, well you get the standard output. So what you get inside Jenkins exactly is exactly what you would get from uh, your terminal if you were just launching Ansible. That's good. Um, because you get notification, uh, you can see if something went wrong, and so you get exactly the same, um, uh, the same output. But Ansible has other way of working, so that's a standard output plugin. But uh, there are other callback available, and one that is perfect for Jenkins is GUnit. I don't know if people know that, um, but it's a native callback, it's there in Ansible by default, it can output GUnit XML file and Jenkins know exactly what to do with those uh, Jenkins, those, those GUnit files. So just have a look, but it's there, just enable the callback, uh, just say where it produced the XML and Jenkins will just retrieve the XML and give you some statistics, for example, in a different way. So for example, that's hopefully that's readable. Um, so that's an example uh, in Jenkins of um, all the, the tasks that were applied uh, by, uh, by Ansible, but with it has some statistics like, well, I, don't, I can't even read that myself, which is a problem. <laughs> but basically you have when it was triggered, how many seconds it was needed just for that specific task, etc. So you have even more information than what you have in the normal standard output of Ansible. And you get it for free because you just have to enable the, the callback. And if you click on each task, you see the result and see what was done and all the tasks that was, okay, fail, change or not. So it's just a call back to plug into enable. Another one which is interesting, it was, it's not really tied to Jenkins, but uh, I like the output that it produces is ARA. So uh, it's, re it's written and maintained by one of my colleagues from Red Hat Canada for OpenStack initially, uh, for RDO. Uh, and they use that because if you have a look at all the jobs that have in ci.center.org, it's Ansible all over the place. But they have really, really heavy uh, task and check for uh, RDO setup because OpenStack is not that easy to set up. So I'll let you imagine the, the size of the playbook and the execution for the multi-node testing uh, when they spin up new cloud image, etc. So um, just to have a better view, they enable, it's a callback plugin again, uh, one that you have to install. Uh, and it output everything into a database and then there is a nice, uh, I think it's based on Django uh, for the web UI and you can have a look at all the, the task, the playbook call, all the variables that were embedded, etc. So it's not in embedded in, in Jenkins but you can enable that callback at the same time. Um, and of course as a season mean if I want to regularly um, launch Ansible playbook, I want to get some notification. So Jenkins by default do a lot, a lot, a lot of, of notification, but mail of course, SMTP, IRC if you want, but no. So <laughs> once again, MQTT of course. Uh, we <laughs> well, in fact, it, in, fa in fact, you are maybe the one to blame for that because now that you introduced me to MQTT a long time ago, I'm trying to use it a lot, including for well. In fact, all the, the CentOS 7.5, I mean, if you have question about CentOS 5, which is now built, but not yet pushed, uh, everything happened through MQTT for some of the builds between the distributed environments, and uh, it's really easy. So, um, of course, uh, Jenkins has an MQTT uh, plugin for notification, so that's easy. And then I have on, on, my, on my broker, I have also some subscriber that just watch and say, oh, that's, that job failed and get notification on IRC or whatever. But Jenkins itself doesn't need to do that. It doesn't need to connect to IRC. So everything is going through a message bus because for me, I'm using M MQTT as a simple uh, message bus. And of course, well, why not some, some advertising for MQTT1? Uh, 
But if you have question about that, you can ask GP. So. And now about the, the scaling out. Um, the real, real intensive thing in, uh, in, uh, in Ansible is the, um, the number of SSH connections it has to open in parallel. So there is something that is really new that I haven't had a chance to test myself called Mitogen. I don't know if it, it made the buzzword on Twitter uh, two weeks ago. Who heard about Mitogen? Some, some people. Not tested myself. But I ping some of the Ansible force and they are in touch with the guy because they are really interested into that because it really speeds up uh, the way the modules, the, all the modules are bootstrapped on all the machine. So you sp it speeds really the things up. So maybe th it can be that with Metagen I can just have one machine, but it's still using SSH. Uh, so you can tune SSH with uh, pipelining, control master, all the, all the traditional SSH tuning you can do. But still, I wanted something really sim uh, simple. And let me just take an analogy. Uh, because of uh, the fact that we have nodes really here and there, uh, even our monitoring system, Zabbix, at the moment, is we have, of course, a central server, but we have plenty of Zabbix proxy all around the world just to monitor specific nodes because they are nearby. It's fast for them to collect the data. The central server doesn't uh, even know how to get there because you would be surprised that even on Internet, well, sometimes a machine doesn't know how to reach because of BGP problem. So, uh, um, but the, the, the proxy can and has fast connection. So I said, well, in fact, if we could just reuse the same principle that we are using for monitoring with uh, Ansible Playbook, that would be perfect. We just can delegate some of the tasks to a machine nearby. And that's exactly uh, what we decided to do with the slaves. Because from a Jenkins point of view, the master is just a controller, doesn't run any task, any job at all. All the jobs are uh, given to specific slaves. So um, the idea is that a job is fetched by one of the slaves. It then takes all the connection, uh, it launches the playbook on all the nodes, and it reports everything back to the machine, uh, the central machine, so the Jenkins master, so that we have the artifact, we have the log, everything is stored locally. Uh, but the, the code execution is really fast because it's really nearby. Um, one thing to keep in mind with the slave is that the slave is really a dumb machine. So it's just a machine. Well, in our case, it's, it makes sense to have sent us a machine, of course. Um, with the only requirement is um, Java, uh, OpenGDK install. After that, the, the master just take control and launch this, the slave automatically. It needs, of course, to have Ansible, but it doesn't need to have um, the, the GPG agent running because that's something that Jenkins do for you. So on each job, it will automatically open the connection. It will pass the SSH agent needed for Ansible to run. And when a job finishes, it just kills the SSH uh, agent. So nothing is on disk at all uh, when it's executed on the, uh, uh, by the slave. The only uh, thing you have to know is the connectivity be between slave and master, especially if you are having a lot of slave um, all around the, uh, the globe. Jenkins itself says that, well, you can open a port, a TCP port in your Jenkins setup, because it doesn't go through the traditional HTTP, it doesn't use the, the HTTP mechanism for the transport. So it's GNLP port that you have to open, and they, cla they, they, they claim that, well, version 4 supports TLS. I don't know for you, but trusting someone from Java saying that TLS is enabled, I'm not sure that I would do it, so I'm not using that. So do you have two other ways, of course, VPN connection works, end-to-end uh, uh, -end, uh, VPN connection works for that, <laughs> or um, SSH slave, so if you can SSH in from the master to the slave, it will automatically use the SSH connection for un double encryption, because you still have the one from GNLP, but it just let you connect automatically, it does the port forward for you, so you don't have to, to deal about anything like that. So it's just transparent. The other solution is if, for example, you are in a firewall environment where you can't get in, you can have the sledge itself connect to the, the, the main machine. Uh, but you don't want to have the GNLP port open, so you still want encryption. And for that, something that works really uh, well, and that's still uh, really a thing for me, is external. So external does the port forward through TLS socket uh, automatically. Um, the only thing that you have to, to do at the Jenkins level is inform at the node level that, oh, that node will not connect to me, but to local host and the port that you define in external. 
and it will be then transparent. So, and as to know, it's really easy to automate with Ansible as well, if you want to. So, but then, so let's suppose that you have thousands of, of slaves. How can you select, I select um, the correct one that you want your job to run? Because I don't want to have a slave running in Asia to suddenly launch a playbook and reach the node in the US. That's, that would defeat completely the reason why I'm, I'm doing slaves. So you can assign label, uh, label to slaves. And my idea was, well, for example, it's in my inventory, I have some group that uh, reflects my geo, geo IP stuff. And I'm using the same label in Jenkins so that I'm now limiting, um, when I launch a playbook, I'm just limiting to the specific label so that a machine just limits to the label that he has the node for, is is um, sorry, is responsible for. Um, that means that the same, um, uh, in a multi-configuration project, for example, in Jenkins, I can just enable all the slaves, I've just one job, and that will be kicked on all the slaves at the same time, and, the, and they will just target the node that they are responsible for and not the other one. And everything will be back at the log level. The other one that I like is uh, the, the parameterized job. So um, suddenly you can also, in s one single job, say that you want to launch multiple playbooks against multiple slaves at the same time with only one job. So um, it just makes sense for you to, to have, s that's, m that's, if you know Jenkins, that's suddenly like a matrix thing where it will just try all the possible combination. Um, I had no time, sorry, to for demo because I was right. I was really busy with 7.5 Rebel this week. I know that people know that it was landed. It landed. So, uh, but if you have question, no, then we need to all attend GP's talk about AWX later today. <laughs> <laughs>